And welcome back to Consumer Choice Radio. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, our next guest, his first appearance on the show. Um, he is the conservative leadership candidate, Scott Aitchison. Uh Thank you very much for joining us on Consumer Choice Radio. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So you have put your name into the ring um, for uh, conservative leader. What was driving you to put your name forward? I know it's quite a feat. It is it is a, a onerous process. Um, what was it that drove you to want to uh, lead the party and then ultimately uh, become prime minister? Well, I, I got to tell you, since getting to Ottawa, uh, I, I was elected in the class of 2019 after a you know pretty long stint in municipal politics. I was first elected when I was 21 years old to my local town council. Of course, it was Huntsville, so it was a part-time gig. I had to work real jobs at the same time as well. And uh, But the last five years before getting elected federally, I was the mayor of Huntsville. And, uh, you know, I, I led a really pretty cohesive community and, and, uh, and, and a pretty engaged council. Uh, and, and my experience when I got to Ottawa was that, uh, I, I guess, you know, my assessment was that there was an awful lot of folks in leadership positions that didn't really seem to understand leadership. I've always believed that leadership is about uh, actually engaging and empowering and inspiring the team around you to, to great things. Uh, and that, uh, you know, as a, if I was going to be the leader of the party, um, you know, that, that, that I was seeking the position of leader of a team. Mm -hmm. And that that team needed to be, you know, empowered. And so, uh, I, I, you know, I, it was one of those things where I think I've, I've been thinking about it all along. Wasn't necessarily thinking this time around necessarily, but uh, but was, you know, talking to enough uh, folks in, in the conservative movements in our caucus. And we decided, you know, the kind of campaign that I would run, uh, the kind of individual I am and the messages that I think are important to be talked about. Um, this was a good time to do it because. Our politics has become so divisive, not, mm -hmm. not just within our conservative family, but really across the political spectrum. Our, our, you know, our politics is designed to divide us, to win more votes. And I, I'm, I'm really frustrated by that. And I think a lot of Canadians are. And so we said, OK, well, let, let, you know, if you're frustrated by what's going on, you don't just sit back and hope it gets better. You roll up your sleeves and jump in and, yep. uh, and demonstrate that you can do things better, do things different. Yeah, and I, I think that, at least from what I've anecdotally seen on Twitter, that that tone or that approach that you just described seems to be very much appreciated. I've seen some describe you as the adult in the room um, in terms of your approach to politics and, um, and praised you for two of your latest uh, policy announcements. I'll go with... Uh, the first one, uh, which caught my eye, which is your policy in regards to housing and what the federal government can do. Um, walk our listeners through what you think uh, the federal government can do to help alleviate some of the housing crisis we're seeing. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, again, reflecting on my experience as a mayor, and, and, and before I was mayor, I always chaired the planning committee. So, of course, you know, getting homes built is uh, is very much a municipal and provincial issue. But uh, that's why, I, you know, the role for the federal government uh, and one of the things that I always found frustrating as a mayor was just despite the work that we were doing locally, what all we seem to be missing was a reliable federal partner uh, with, you know, small incentive kind of money to help, you know, get projects off the ground. They just they weren't reliable. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, I realize that the federal government, current federal government, is, has promised billions upon billions of dollars for housing. Uh, and yet, uh, as I said before, they're, they're pretty long on photo ops announcing money, but pretty short on ribbon cuttings. They're not getting the job done. Well, part of the reason for that is because of, you know, what we call exclusionary zoning. So to give you an example, in the city of Toronto, as an example, which uh, I don't mean to pick on Toronto because it's an issue across the board. Um, but in the city of Toronto, 70% of the, of, of the land, the residential lands in Toronto, are zoned for single family use exclusively. So they're not, you know, you're not allowed to turn it into a duplex as of right. You're not allowed to have, you know, necessarily a, an apartment in the basement. You have to go through, 
you know, a fairly painful planning process with get rezoning and all those kinds of things. And, you know, you, everyone's heard of the expression NIMBYism, that's the not in mm -hmm. my backyard. Uh, and yet, you know, if, if municipal governments uh, actually had the courage of their convictions to say, okay, we, we need more density, uh, and there are lots of ways you can you can increase density without affecting character, which is a very important language in 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 urban planning. But you can increase density dramatically without affecting character. Uh, all kinds of places. We need we need to we need to have the courage of our convictions to get it done because there are people suffering in this country who literally don't have a place to sleep. And so, you know, the federal government gives billions of dollars every year to municipal governments and provincial governments uh, for infrastructure projects, whether it's huge urban transit or small rural bridges, the federal government's involved uh, with that money. And so I just said, you know, let's, let's, let's work with all levels of government, but let's start tying that federal money to results on issues that Canadians desperately need results on. And I think housing is really the foundation of anything in life. If you don't have a warm, safe bed to sleep in, you can't expect to do anything else, really. Get a, get, you know, get an education, get a job, self-actualize in any way. We need homes, and it's a supply issue. Uh, and so we can, we can, you know, yes, we can use federal money to assist with the development of, uh, of affordable rentals. We definitely need more social housing and supportive mm -hmm. housing in this country. We can, we can give money directly for those kinds of projects, but we need to tie you know, the, the big federal box to getting results. And so I understand the system well enough. Um, I've been in it well long enough in the municipal sector mm -hmm. that I know as a federal, as a federal leader and a prime minister, um, I know that there are ways we can tie that. I, I just think it's, it's a smarter use of, uh, of all taxpayer dollars and uh, having us all work together. We need results. That's all it comes yeah. down to. And, you know, it's not, it's not, we're not getting results now. Yeah, yeah, it's very much the the current system has failed uh, for a variety of reasons, and so um, why not incentivize that um, by tying those funds and maybe have some some municipalities look at exclusion exclusionary zoning and and um, what they can what property owners can build as of right. I think that would certainly help, um, especially on the missing middle. Um, I know right now for a lot of people who are my age, it's um, maybe you could afford a condo, maybe um, six, 600 square feet. And then outside of that, uh, you have all sorts of other housing units that are 1 million, 1.2 million, 1.6 million. So uh, it's definitely needed. Um, on another issue, um, which I would call a sacred cow in conservative politics, pardon the pun, is supply management. And I was personally overjoyed when I saw you come out against supply management. Um, but what is your justification for ending supply management? Well, the primary justification for me is affordability for Canadians. Yeah, you know, you know, one in five Canadians live under the poverty line. And supply management makes basic foods like milk more expensive, a, you know, family with children, it costs them almost $600 a year more in groceries. And, and so uh, to me, it's about affordability, but it's also, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a kind of person who wants to pit farmers against consumers or, mm -hmm. you know, create a war. There are going to be dairy farmers that aren't happy about this because the status quo has given them stability. And I understand that. And it will take some time to unwind a 50 year old policy. But you know, by by locking um, our farmers into the Canadian market and locking you know other countries' goods out of our markets with huge tariffs, you know we've created a system where yeah we have stability in our dairy markets and our dairy farmers, but they they can't really market their products to the world. Canada is an exporting nation. If we don't export, we don't live the life we live. Mm -hmm. And I I just think that you know we have some of the best dairy farms some of the best dairy farming practices and some of the best products in the world. Uh, and, and, and by getting out of this system that traps uh, innovative farmers into just our market, uh, we, can, we can open huge opportunities around the world. I've given the example of New Zealand. 
uh, which exported $17 billion worth of, worth of dairy products last year. And, you know, there's 5 million people in that country. There's 38, <laughs> almost 40 million here in Canada. We exported $378 million worth of dairy products last year because mm-hmm. other countries shut us out of our market. So when you call it a sacred cow, it's, it's, a, it's a cute pun, but it's true. Um, and, and this is an example of, of what I think is just really smart policy that helps Canadians who are struggling with inflation, who are struggling with, the, you know, a carbon tax adds, you know, cost to everything you eat. Everything that you buy in a grocery store is shipped in a truck. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? They're paying more to ship that, you know, everything's costing more because of, you know, bad liberal policy for about seven years. Uh, and now inflationary pressures, which I grant you, there are some global impacts that are causing some of the inflationary pressures we're seeing. But, uh, you know, as a result of, uh, of all these policies and all these, you know, seven years of liberal, liberal rule, yep. life's getting really expensive and it's hard for families to eat. I, I can tell you, I can give you real examples in Perry Sound, Muskoka, my riding of people that I know, I know them well, who call me in tears because they're not too sure if they can afford to heat their home and eat like proud people have worked hard all their lives going to food banks because, and they're ashamed Mm -hmm. that should never happen in this country. And so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all about helping people like that. This is, this is, this is not a political ploy. It's not a game. This Mm -hmm. is just smart policy that actually helps farmers and it makes life more affordable for the people most vulnerable in our society. And so on both both of those policies, I think something that really echoes here is is the reality that that ordinary Canadians are facing food inflation, skyrocketing housing prices, increasing rents. Do you think that maybe there has been a bit of a disconnect in Ottawa um, over maybe just over COVID or maybe over the last seven years in regards to what real life looks like for ordinary Canadians? Absolutely. 1000%. Honestly, Ottawa, you know, I I delivered a speech uh, in response to the government's use of the Emergency Measures Act. And I mean, I didn't talk as much about the Emergency Measures Act as other people did. But but what I pointed out in that speech is that is that we've had now decades of a political system in Ottawa that is this zero sum game about winning. Uh, and they slice and dice the electorate and they and and they prey upon the differences of opinion that exist between urban and rural and east and west and 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 you know the vaccinated and the unvaccinated mm-hmm. you, you you look at our political system it's designed to divide us our our leaders should be should be working hard to unite us and bring us together uh, and and to me that's the problem in ottawa it's about it's about winning it's about it's about you know, crafting policies in such a way to know that you're going to court this group over here, even if it means pissing off that group over there, but they tend to vote conservative. So let's do it this way. Honestly, if I, and I said this in my speech, you know, those of us in the house of commons that served in municipal government, we all know full well, we all know full well that if we behaved in local councils, the way that politicians behave in Ottawa, we'd get our butts kicked on the main street. People wouldn't put up with that. Mm -hmm. And Ottawa needs to operate. I, I just think it needs some needs some small town uh, small town mayor to, to you know focus on why we're there in the first place. We're there to help help people, support people, to 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 make Canada to you know a free country with opportunity for all. Uh, and that's what's missing. It's about winning. It's not about it's not about helping Canadians. Yeah, it it feels like sometimes um, it's forgotten that um, the private whomever the prime minister is, is the prime minister for all Canadians, not just those who, who voted for them. Um, we have about 45 seconds left. Where can people find out more information about your leadership campaign? Well, thank you for this opportunity. And I'll, I'll, I'll just say votescott.ca. Nobody can spell my last name. So you can see how you spell my first name behind me here. Votescott.ca. Please come check us out. We are uh, in the final stages of uh, putting together all the money we need to be on the ballot and pay some bills, but uh, I, I think Canadians are, uh, are really, uh, it's resonating, this message and my style. I want to have a conversation about policy ideas that help Canadians, so check us out. Great. Well, thank you again for joining us. Um, those two policies have uh, our, our consumer uh, advocates very excited, and I look forward to seeing how this develops. Thanks very much. Yeah.